again, you need to be under the preaching of the Word of God. You need to be under the teaching of the Word of God. And, and that begins in a local church, to be with a pastor who preaches the Bible, who has nothing to say except the Bible. That's where it begins. And then to do your own personal study uh, through the various means that Ligonier has. Um, it's, there, there is a wealth of material that Ligonier has on how to be biblically literate. Uh, you need to know the storyline of the Bible. You need to know the main movements of the Bible. You need to know the theology and the doctrine of the Bible. Um, and you need to know in church history those who have lived it and who have proclaimed it. And so we need to be like Charles Haddon Spurgeon instead of John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. Spurgeon said, why, the man was a walking Bible. Prick him anywhere and he bleeds bibline. We need to be walking Bibles. Our very vocabulary needs to be not just the truth of Scripture, but the very words themselves of Scripture. We need to answer with Scripture. We need to counsel others with Scripture. Um, we, we need to sing Scripture. Um, the, the Word of God is, is really the key, and so biblical literacy, getting the Word of God into your heart and into your soul. And then you can also take a book in the Bible, and for 30 days I'm going to read again and again and again, depending upon its length, this book in the Bible. I would suggest two in the New Testament, which would be Romans and the Gospel of John. And I would suggest at least one in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. If, if you could know those three books, you're, you are well ahead to know how the entire rest of the Bible fits together. Do you know what Spurgeon said? The Prince of Preachers, you listen to me because if you do not learn this, all the other stuff you learn will not help you much. He said, I would rather teach one man to pray than teach ten men to preach. Now this came from one of the greatest of all preachers. What does this world need? We do not need more movers and shakers. We do not need more clever men. We do not need more strategies. There is more missionary activity on this planet right now than any time in the history of Christianity, and most of it is nothing more than smoke and mirrors. Because the task of the missionary is the same task of the pastor, and vice versa. It is primarily to know God, to be before God, to study God's Word, and then to go out and proclaim the Word studied, to proclaim the God that is known. And this cannot be done just by the intellect. It must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not allow so many false prophets that exist today saying so many rude and blasphemous things against the Holy Spirit. Do not allow them to steal your inheritance. Jesus did not ask you, He did not suggest to you that you pray at all times and not lose heart. He did not lay that down as a spiritual growth principle. He laid it down as a command. I beg you to cultivate a life of study. I beg you to cultivate a life of prayer. God will work in your life to empty you, to break you, to show you that you can do absolutely nothing. Even in your brilliant expositions, you can do absolutely nothing unless the Spirit of the living God is breathing through that place. It is the Spirit of God. What most fail to realize is that the Spirit of God is most promised to work among God's ministers when they are lashed down to the gospel. You are called to search out the most superior things and then give them to the people who hear you. And you are called upon to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And none of that will happen unless you are a man of prayer. The man who is used of God is the man who clings tenaciously to Christ. Oh, I would pray that you would see your need so that you would grab a hold of the person of God in Christ, that you would depend wholly upon His good spirit, 
that you would see your primary task as mining out the gold of the knowledge of God and of presenting it to God's people. What do we need on the mission field? Give me a man who spends the great portion of his morning in the study of God's word on his knees in prayer and then going out from there every day and proclaiming what he has discovered in the power that he has discovered of preaching faithfully God's word and ministering with a sacrificial love. The darkness that's out there is so terrifyingly great. If you ever look down the mouth of evil, it'll chew you up in a millisecond. You can do nothing against that. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, lashed to the word of God, proclaiming it in boldness and living in humility, Every mountain can be lifted up. Do not hide behind the sovereignty of God. It is the sovereignty of God that tells us the kingdom can advance. The nations can know. So catch that vision and go. It's important that we understand the gospel correctly. And when the gospel is preached or presented in a way that doesn't line up with scripture, it's important that we, we take note of that so that the gospel remains pure and true as it is revealed from God in scripture. Billy Graham, unfortunately, did not always preach the true gospel. John MacArthur on Billy Graham, I can't imagine a more disastrous belief than that. What is he talking about? So let's listen to what Billy Graham said. This is for our edification and our clarification on what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? Well, Christianity and being a true believer, you know, I think there's the, the, the body of Christ, which comes from all the Christian groups around the world, or outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping uh, revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that, the Apostle James, in the first council in Jerusalem, when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world, uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. This is fantastic. I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There's a wideness in God's mercy. There is. There's a wideness. Pastor John's response to this uh, is what I want to play for you now. A couple of weeks ago, I quoted from the L.A. Times, quote from the Pope, just to show you that the Catholic Church believes this. 
Pope John Paul II said this week that all who live a just life will be saved even if they do not believe in Jesus Christ and the Roman Catholic Church. Pope went on to say, quote, The Gospel teaches us that those who live in accordance with the Beatitudes, poor in spirit, the pure of heart, those who bear lovingly the sufferings of life, will enter God's kingdom, end quote. The Pope is taking an inclusive view of salvation. Uh, the biblical teaching that salvation only comes in response to faith in Jesus Christ is rejected as unreasonable and cruel by people who believe this. The heathen are saved if they just live good lives, if they're just poor in spirit, if they are pure in heart, and if they pursue what is right. They live good lives and they're sincere. It doesn't really matter what they believe. This has been in the fabric of Roman Catholicism for centuries. That is why Catholic apologist Peter Kreeft, who wrote the book Ecumenical Jihad, can say that there are Buddhists and there are Hindus and there are Confucianists and there are Muslims and there are atheists and there are uh, Orthodox Jews uh, all in heaven because Christ is not the issue, the Gospel is not the issue, the Bible is not the issue, sincerity and goodness is the issue. And this is the natural theology idea that man by his natural powers, his reasoning powers and some innate goodness can ascend to the knowledge of God and the will of God and please God and earn salvation whether he ever sees the Bible or ever hears about Jesus Christ. The Pope simply affirming what Catholic theology has long believed. Now this is somehow motivated by some human conception of fairness. It's not fair somehow for somebody somewhere uh, not to be able to be saved when they don't have immediate access to the gospel. But it's not just a Catholic view. And I'm going to reiterate something I, I read to you a few weeks ago because I want it on this tape. There was a, an interview that was held between Robert Schuler and Dr. Billy Graham on the Hour of Power. I have the transcript of that conversation. The conversation went like this. Dr. Schuler said, tell me, what is the future of Christianity? Dr. Graham said, I think there's the body of Christ, which comes from all the Christian groups around the world, or outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. In other words, what he's saying is uh, there are people in the body of Christ who never heard of Christ, uh, so we don't need to expect that they're all going to come to Christ. They're going to come another way. Further, he says, God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name, and that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have. And they turn to the only light they have, and I think they're saved, and they're going to be with us in heaven. Dr. Schuler responded, what I hear you saying is that it's possible for Jesus Christ to come into a human heart and soul and life even if they've been born in darkness and have never heard and never had exposure to the Bible. Is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? Dr. Graham, yes it is because I believe that. I've met people in various parts of the world in tribal situations. They've never seen a Bible or heard about a Bible, have uh, never heard of Jesus, but they believed in their hearts that there is a God and they've tried to live a life that was quite apart from the surrounding community in which they live. Dr. Schuler, this is fantastic. I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. Dr. Graham, there is, there certainly is. This has certainly leaped from Aristotle to the Catholic Church into evangelical Protestantism. Now we have a kind of Protestant viewpoint that says Muslims and Hindus and whoever are going to be in the body of Christ, in the kingdom, in heaven, with salvation, whether they ever get a Bible or whether they ever hear the gospel or whether they ever know about Jesus Christ. The uh, Billy Graham organization affirmed that this position is the same as the one articulated in an article in Decision magazine, which Billy wrote in 1960, so this is not something new. Uh, Clark Pinnock, uh, when I was a student in seminary, he wrote a book called Set Forth Your Case, which was a really a fine Christian apologetic, a Christian evidentialism book, and um, he was, uh, you know, a great champion for the Christian faith. He has since wandered far away uh, and apostatized from that uh, to the point where he now is probably the, the leading proponent of this wider mercy view. And I'll quote, he says this, When we approach the man of faith other than our own, somebody in another religion, it will be in a spirit of expectancy to find out how God has been speaking to him and what new understanding of the grace and love of God we may ourselves discover in this encounter. Our first task in approaching another people, another culture, another religion, 
is to take off our shoes. The place we are approaching is holy. Else we find ourselves treading on men's dreams. More, we may forget that God was here before our arrival. Now that redefines missions pretty significantly. Instead of going into a tribe and saying these people are lost, these people are doomed in darkness, you walk in there and you say you're standing on holy ground because God has been there in the form of their paganism. He adds, does Pinnock, God has more going on by way of redemption than what happened in first century Palestine, end quote. I, I can't imagine a more disastrous belief than that. I can remember where I was when Billy Graham was on that morning show. Um, folks, it was very shocking, and it's very um, concerning. You and I and others need to know what the true gospel is, and that is that there's salvation through Christ alone. you got to know who Jesus is. you got to know what he did. Jesus Christ, through his life, death, Burial and resurrection provided the only way that you and I and anyone in the entire world can have peace with God. We need to know who Christ is, know that we're sinners, repent of our sins, and trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. It's the only way. Billy Graham got it wrong. MacArthur corrected him on it as well as other people did. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who shall speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Does the prophet speak of himself or of someone else? He's talking of a man who knew great suffering and humiliation. The man who taught us that through faith we will find salvation in him. Who is this man? He is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin, sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me unpack those 15 Greek words. He, God, made Jesus sin. What do you mean he made Jesus sin? Only in one sense. He treated him as if he had committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, though in fact he committed none of them. Hanging on the cross, he was wholly harmless, undefiled. Hanging on the cross, he was a spotless lamb. He was never for a split second a sinner. He is holy God on the cross. But God is treating him, I'll put it more practically, as if he lived my life. God punished Jesus for my sin, turns right around and treats me as if I lived his life. Amen. That's the great doctrine of substitution, and on that doctrine turned the whole reformation of the church. That is the heart of the gospel. Do you repent your sins? I do. I do. I have looked past God. I have been proud and I have been conceited. I have been an ambassador for violence and hate. That is past. What matters is who you now choose to be. Huh. Are you ready? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross and rose again on the third day? I do. 
Then in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you.